want to let you know why the Wayside Inn Foundation selected this topic. 2023 is the 100th anniversary of Henry and Clara Ford's purchase of the Wayside Inn property. And as the anniversary was discussed among our planning committees and the board of trustees, it was agreed that we would hold programs and events over the course of the year that would examine the evolution of the Wayside Inn and its preservation story from the Ford's vision onward. So 100 years of preservation and growth at the Wayside Inn. So now, um, Jesse Swigger is an associate professor and director of public history at Western Carolina University, where she's worked since receiving her PhD in American Studies from the University of Texas at Austin. At Western Carolina University, she teaches courses in public history and urban history, and her book, History is Bunk, Assembling the Past at Henry Ford's Greenfield Village, was published in 2015 as part of the University of Massachusetts Press's Public History and Historical Perspective series. She's currently working on a book about the first four children's museums in the United States and has published articles on this topic in the Journal for History of Childhood and Youth and Museum Education. So Dr. Swigger, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Sally. I really appreciate it. And I re really appreciate you inviting me to be here with you all this evening. So I'm going to now try to share my screen. <laughs> Always exciting. And am I shared? Hopefully. Yes. Okay. Yes, you are. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So the title of my talk this evening is The Wayside Inn, A Product of Its Time. And I'm going to start by um, talking a little bit about Greenfield Village. Um, and <clears throat> the reason that I want to do that is because, as Sally mentioned, um, I write about Greenfield Village. In the book, I'm covering not just um, the time period when Henry Ford was <clears throat> creating Greenfield Village, but also the decades after that and how much it changed after he um, passed away in 1947. And when he died, um, administrators, curators, and interpreters were left to make his landscape cohere in a way that fit with the scholarly and popular approaches to history of their time. They succeeded using a wide range of strategies and methods, transforming the village landscape and its interpretation of the past in a number of ways. So you can just see by looking at the two maps, how dramatically um, Greenfield Village changed um, from 1947 to the present. Now there are themes that um, are more historical in nature, the placards around the village have a lot of uh, historical information. And that's just to give you a sense of um, that transformation. But I am not gonna talk about that transformation tonight. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, why it wasn't strange that Henry Ford, who famously said history is more or less bunk, was involved in um, preserving the Wayside Inn and also in creating um, Greenville Village. So just to give you a sense of how Henry Ford um, thought about the past and how he um, connected it to the present, um, we can look at some examples of the buildings that he did decide to bring to Greenfield Village. And so, um, and he did this a little bit at the wayside as well, but you can see the Wright Cycle Shop um, was brought from Dayton, Ohio. And the same thing here with the Wright Home also moved to, Green to Dearborn. Um, H.J. Heinz's home from Sharpsburg, Pennsylvania. And then I think this is another good example of how he thought about the past. You can see here he did um, relocate William Holmes McGuffey's birthplace from Pennsylvania, but then actually reconstructed um, William Holmes McGuffey's school at the village in 1934, although they did use logs found on that Pennsylvania farmstead. 
So Greenfield Village was never a real place, um, but Henry Ford created this imaginary small town where all of um, the people that he admired um, lived and imaginary <laughs> of life. And so one of the funny things that happened in the village um, often was that people would think, well, no wonder they came up with all these wonderful inventions. They all lived next door to one another. <laughs> um, and the centerpiece of Greenfield Village was the recreation of um, Thomas Edison's Menlo Park Laboratory. And that was his friend and his mentor and the man he admired most. So <clears throat> in addition to buildings associated with famous figures, there are structures that Ford added to the site because he found their architecture or their meaning relevant. Two brick slave cabins, a Cotswold cottage and jewelry shop from England and a tenant farmer's home are a few examples. These buildings are perhaps most helpful in revealing Ford's understanding of which histories were not bunk the histories of inventors, writers, farmers, artisans, and educators, as opposed to political, economic, and especially military histories. Ford's view of the past was seen by many as just another example of his idiosyncratic and often contradictory worldview. But if we look at the popular uses of the past during his lifetime, it becomes clear that his preservation work was very much a product of its time. In doing so, we can understand why, despite his now famous, infamous assertion to the Chicago Tribune that history is more or less bunk, Ford collected hundreds of copies of McGuffey readers, hosted colonial themed dances for his friends, and why he bought the Wayside Inn. Tonight, I'm going to focus on two movements that developed during Ford's lifetime and overlap with his historical activities. The first is the colonial revival movement, and the second is a transnational movement, the Outdoor History Museum movement. So first I'm gonna talk about the colonial revival. The phrase colonial revival first brings architecture to mind, but it found its way into a wide range of cultural products, ranging from furniture to food. Most scholars trace its origins to the years following the Civil War, in the late 1860s, a second industrial revolution began to reshape the landscape. Many Americans celebrated the new technological innovations, consumer products, and urbanization that followed. But others, particularly native born white Protestants found these transformations and in particular the mass immigration that accompanied them anxiety provoking. For many, promoting the aesthetics and values of the nation's colonial and revolutionary periods offered a solution, providing a cultural anchor in a period of explosive change. At the 1876 Philadelphia Centennial, the United States hosted the World's Fair for the first time, and here's a map of that event, and this aesthetic was sold to willing public consumers. For example, at the Ye Old Time Kitchen, guests could enjoy a plate of traditional New England fare served up by Emma Southwick Britton and her assistants. Dressed in colonial garb, these women served up pork and beans, donuts, and flapjacks with molasses. Henry Ford was just 13 years old in 1876 and still living on the family farm in Springwells Township, Michigan but he was one of 20 million Americans who attended the Chicago World's Fair 17 years later. And by that time, the colonial revival was everywhere. As one scholar noted, 21 of the 39 states constructed colonial style buildings. Virginia was one of these, recreating George Washington's Mount Vernon with significant financial assistance from the Virginia Board of World's Fair managers. When the state appropriation of $25,000 proved too paltry, they began a successful fundraising campaign, describing it as their patriotic duty. Another state to use colonial architecture was Massachusetts, 
According to the Board of Managers, the structure simultaneously conveyed a, quote, air of aristocratic distinction and reserve and dignity and a homelike and comfortable appearance, end quote. The colonial revival also found its way inside. The Essex Institute of Salem ensured that the building was filled with furniture, art, coins, pamphlets, newspapers, manuscripts, and snuff boxes from the period. Along with buildings and material culture, visitors could watch the performance America, written and produced by Imre Karalfi, this play represented a nostalgic and celebratory portrayal of the nation's founding in four acts. Emma Britton was back at the fair with her colonial themed restaurant and a new display, The Ripe Fruit of Freedom, recreated the Liberty Bell. Many biographers believe that Henry Ford first got his idea for the quadricycle at the World's Fair but perhaps it also sparked his interest in colonial culture. The simultaneous celebration of American progress and the past at the Chicago World's Fair help us understand why the man who many argued invented modern life developed a passion for the buildings, objects, and cultural traditions of the colonial and revolutionary eras. As the scholar Bridget A. May has shown, it was not uncommon to find advocates for the colonial revival who embraced other aspects of modern life. One of these groups was progressive reformers who embraced colonial revival architecture and interior decor. And we can look at their activities to see this apparent contradiction and kind of understand um, why they held these seemingly contrary beliefs. At the 19th century's end, progressives turned their attention to the American home, which they believed urbanization, industrialization, and immigration threatened. Victorian interior design, which we're looking at right now, emphasized adornment, mixed historical style, styles, and used rich textures and fabrics. Many progressives argued that the style reinforced the crowded chaos of growing cities. In contrast, and right now we're looking for, uh, looking at two pages from a popular magazine, House and Garden. So in contrast, the colonial revival style mirrored the characteristics of the nation's founders who progressives believed were honest, strong, morally superior, and worthy of emulation. Simple and pragmatic, colonial style homes and furniture would offer an escape and respite from city life. Journalists, architects, and others promoted these ideas in their magazines. As the scholar Patricia West has noted, progressives believed that these styles, quote, had the power to uplift character and contribute to civic virtue, unquote. In this way, they also offered a tool for Americanizing newly arrived immigrants. Furniture manufacturers tapped into these politics and used catalogs, magazines, and representations of the past to sell this furniture to the masses. Like other progressive colonial revivalists, Ford had mixed views about modernity. While he heralded the new inventions of the industrial age, he was wary of the cultural shifts that accompanied them. Ford's nostalgia for his childhood often led the way in determining which histories he found worthy of support and preservation. His passion for collecting McGuffey readers, the textbooks he read in school were one example. The preservation of his birthplace, which he moved 200 feet when the construction of a new road threatened to destroy it, was another. Also, like other progressives, anti-Semitic, xenophobic, and prejudiced ideas drove, at least in part, Ford's interest in the past. In 1916, he bought the weekly publication, The Dearborn Independent, part newspaper, part magazine, the Independent included articles on national and local events, 
poetry, and short stories. In each issue, Mr. Ford's own page expressed views on politics, society, and culture. Their titles revealed his boundaries when it came to modernity. Change is not always progress. What makes immigration a problem? And the modern city a pestiferous growth are just a few examples. Like others, Ford found a solution in the aesthetics of the colonial past. When Ford bought the Wayside Inn in 1923, he articulated this view in Garden and Home Builder magazine, saying that, quote, the Wayside Inn is something that ought to be preserved for all time for the public. The inn expressed the pioneer spirit. And if ever we lost that spirit, then we shall stop going forward and start to go back, unquote. The second example I want to talk about today is the Transnational Outdoor History Museum movement. So when Ford announced plans to turn the Wayside Inn into a historical museum, he joined what was by then a movement in Europe. Credit for the first outdoor history museum is given to Arthur Hazelius, who is here, a Swedish scholar, folklorist, and founder of the Nordiska Museum. Like other progressives in the US, Hazelius feared that industrialization was eroding important cultural traditions in Sweden. By preserving and presenting the material culture from the pre-industrial age, he believed, Swedish citizens would be able to retain the most important aspects of their past. You can see here, these are two ads for Skansen, which was um, most people say is the first um, outdoor history museum. When he opened Skansen in 1891, visitors could tour over 75 acres of land and see what a typical 19th century Scandinavian community looked like. The Outdoor History Museum idea reached the United States in the early 1900s when Reverend W.A.R. Goodwin, rector of Bruton Parish Church, worried that Williamsburg, Virginia's famous colonial architecture was disappearing. In 1905, Goodwin restored his church and developed a lifelong interest in preservation. After a brief sojourn in Rochester, New York, Goodwin returned to Williamsburg to find that residents were struggling economically and that the historic landscape continued to disappear. Goodwin began to think beyond preserving individual buildings, eventually hatching a plan to sell the town to a wealthy industrialist and turning it into a museum. But Goodwin was not only worried about saving the town's architecture. He believed that industrialization and the built environment that accompanied it were fueling the rise of anarchy and socialism. He approached Ford with his plan in 1924, who declined, but soon convinced John D. Rockefeller Jr. to finance the endeavor. And in talking about why he wanted to join this effort, Rockefeller said, I have come to feel that perhaps an even greater value than the architecture and the preservation of that colonial architecture is the lesson that it teaches of the patriotism, high purpose, and unselfish devotion of our forefathers to the common good. So you can see a lot of similarities in the way that he's talking about um, colonial Williamsburg and the, sort of the ideas behind the colonial revival movement. Um, and it just, it's interesting to see how um, the Williamsburg sale happened. So you can look at this um, flyer about the meeting. And it's also interesting that they don't mention Rockefeller um, in, in the um, flyer to talk about who's planning to purchase the town.
Around the same time that Goodwin was developing his plan for Williamsburg and Ford was buying the Wayside Inn, Frank Boyden, headmaster of Deerfield Academy, attempted to expand preservation in Deerfield, Massachusetts. Inspired by the partnership between Goodwin and Rockefeller, Boyden sought financial contributions from the wealthy parents of one of his students. New York lawyer Henry N. Flint enrolled his son in Deerfield Academy in 1936, and Boyden quickly cultivated a friendship with him. By the early 1940s, Flint and his wife, Helen, were purchasing old homes and consulting with professionals in, in the decorative arts to help them restore them to their original state. The result was historic, deer, was historic Deerfield. In Southbridge, Massachusetts, Albert B. Wells and his three brothers, who made their fortune from the American Optical Company, consulted with Ford and Rockefeller as they began constructing their outdoor history museum. In 1946, Old Sturbridge Village opened to the public. Visitors saw the recreation of a New England village and the interpretation mixed fact with popular myths. The Wells brothers' goal was to inculcate visitors not only with colonial material culture, but also with the values that the Wells family believed a functional American citizenry required. By the 1940s, numerous other outdoor museums were completed, planned, or under construction in the United States. For example, Stephen Clark opened the Farmers Museum in Cooperstown, New York. In Mystic, Connecticut, the Marine Historical Association acquired a whaling ship and began developing plans to recreate a 19th century seafaring community. And Boston stockbroker Henry Hornblower II founded Plymouth Plantation Incorporated, and soon construction began on a recreation of the Pilgrims' first settlement in North America. When Ford bought the Wayside Inn, he was guided by nostalgia and anxieties about modernity. While Ford did not want to return to the past, he certainly believed in its value. And as we have seen, Ford was not alone in this nostalgia and anxiety. He was a participant in a larger movement to produce and market a consumable past, one that drew on facts and myths and one that married ideas about progress with traditions from the past. In this way, he and others hoped to impose order on the modern world so many of them had participated in creating. All right, thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much. That was, that was excellent in terms of, um, really showing what was happening in the beginning of the 20th century and why we have these institutions today and kind of when they came along. Um, and the whole time I was thinking, you know, I grew up in New England and thank goodness my parents dragged me to almost all of them because I ended up in this field and, and I really think um, these outdoor history museums were, were why. So, um, so I want to make sure people have a chance to ask questions. So I'm going to look at the chat um, now. So I hope you're you're going to put questions in there to ask. Right now I'm I'm not seeing any. Um, I I've been eyeing your book since 2015, actually, when it first came out, and I saw it advertised. And um, when I came to uh, work at the Wayside Inn in 2019, I went and bought a copy because I wanted to know more about Ford and everything. So if anyone is interested, um, this book is available on um, Amazon or I purchased mine through the Henry Ford Museum and probably UMass has it as well. So it is available out there. Um, and I would encourage everyone who has um, more fascination with Ford to get your hands on a copy. Um, so let's see. So I'm not seeing any questions yet. Well, um, so the question was, should we come off mute? But I think just to kind of keep it, you know, so people aren't asking at the same time, maybe we'll just do that. But um, is anyone having trouble? 
getting a question into the chat. How long did it take you to kind of, um, you know, amass your research? And can you tell us a little bit about that process with looking into Sure, all sure. So um, most of my sources come from the Benson Ford archives. So I spent um, probably um, 10 years <laughs> doing research um, on that. Oh, now I'm seeing lots of questions. So um, anyway, <laughs> um, and I did spend time actually with the guides um, in Greenfield Village and shadowing them. And so saw a lot about sort of their day-to-day -day experience. Um, but in the end, I spent most of my time looking at um, the records that Ford meticulously kept. And it sounds like that's a similar process at the wayside where he wanted everything um, preserved and documented. And, and that was certainly true, luckily, at Greenfield Village as well. Yes. Okay, good. So I'm going to go over this chat. Um, the question is, do we know what Ford's pitch was when he approached the sellers of the properties he collected? In other words, um, did he, oh, I have something blocking. In other words, did he say it was for his museum or village or did he just offer money? Um, also, did he want a building that he didn't get? If anyone refused him, does anyone refuse him? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I think he actually had um, agents going out most of the time and um, buying these buildings for him or, um, and, and so, um, I'm actually, I'm sure he was refused, um, at some point, but I'm, I don't know specifically about that. Um, but I do know he had really strong relationships with antique dealers across the country, um, and that he would ask them to find a certain kind of building that he was interested in. Um, they would locate it and then, um, Edward Cutler, who was his um, architect for Greenfield Village, would do most of the legwork after that of like getting it to the village and then because um, they would disassemble and then reassemble um, once they got there. And then a lot of the buildings like the um, like the chapel, <laughs> which you also have one of those, um, mm -hmm. were just built on the grounds. Yeah. And for those local to Sudbury, there was a house of uh, the Plimpton house, which was up on Dutton Road, um, three quarters of the way up the road that was dismantled and sent over. And you can see it in Greenfield Village today. Um, it's a beautiful structure. Um, and there it is. So it came from Sudbury. Um, OK, so I'm going back to the chat. Um, there's a question. The boys' school seemed to be a departure from his colonial-themed Wayside Inn. What hmm. do you have to say about that? Huh. So in, in what way was it um, a departure? I wonder if the, the person who's asking is, you know, his, his focus on education and helping the boys who were wards of the state at that time. It wasn't... Um, it, it was twofold that it started the educational component, but also teaching a trade. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the, so the colonial revival, um, it, the the members, the, the adherence of that were, I mean, it's pretty broadly defined. And so I think he, Ford has such a loose idea of what, that time, you know, he probably wasn't thinking about specific time period periods, but sort of the old ways. And I think he thought that um, education had moved away from these old ways of learning by doing. And so in creating that um, school, I think he actually what I mean, it is sort of in line with his approach of like, okay, we're going to bring back the one room schoolhouse. We're going to bring back McGuffey readers. We're going to um, learn by doing, mm -hmm. we're going to reconnect with the land. And so I think in, in that way, it was consistent with the, the way he was seeing the, the world. I mm -hmm. hope that answers the question enough. 
I'm happy to talk more. <laughs> but not. So Jim, if that didn't, you can do a follow-up question down there in the chat there. <laughs> um, the other question is, um, do you know why he chose the wayside in itself, given that he could have purchased several colonial buildings in this area? Yeah, I think, um, so it's my understanding, and I have to, I am not an expert on the wayside in, but from what I know, I think it's that there were a bunch of people trying to save it at the time. Is that correct? Correct. Um, and so he was sort of part of that, or he heard about that and said, well, I'll just take care of it. But I think he also, he was really interested in, um, the McGuffey readers, one of the things that appealed to him, I think, was their emphasis on poetry. Mm -hmm. And and I and I think he was um, you know, always trying to reconnect with that physically, like in architecture. And I think that's um probably what drew him to that. Um and he also he said, I think, you know, this country isn't very old, um, but you know, uh the Marquis de Lafayette stayed here and Washington stayed here. And so this is, you know, some real history that, that we can actually see. Um, and that and that was really important to him. He thought if you couldn't see it, if it wasn't about, if it wasn't there on the landscape, then you couldn't connect with it. And so I think that was the other reason he was like, okay, we're a young country, but we've got this place and it's really important that it stays here. Great. But I'm sure you know more than I do, Sally, about. Oh, about. Um, <laughs> we are working on an exhibit right now, Lauren Prescott and I. So um, stay tuned because we're finding more and more information as we go. And that exhibit is due to be up uh, shortly <laughs> within the next month. Um, one more question we have. The story we heard is that he had originally planned to build Greenfield Village at the Wayside Wayside site and then altered that decision and put it in Dearborn. Is that true? Um, and if so, do we know the reasoning behind that decision? Wow, I have not heard that. And I'm so curious where where that um where that is, where that story comes from. I um, thought he had bought all this land. My understanding is he bought all the land um, to build the Rouge factory. And then he had this other part of it and he he decided he wanted to build his museum there shortly after. Um, oh no. <laughs> shortly after. No, no, I really want to know like that if that could totally be true. I could totally see that. But I think he wanted it to be uh there um shortly after he had the um the trial about his, the libel lawsuit with the Chicago Tribune and he you know won but he didn't really win mm -hmm. <laughs> won what like 25 cents I think and um and so he was like I'm gonna build a real museum you know and we're gonna do it like they they you know we're gonna show the true history of this country and so I think um that sort of started his um historical projects um, but I think he, to me, to me, I think he's doing the wayside in and planning Greenfield Village all at the same time. Um, so he's just trying to do as much historical stuff as he can. And then Aaron Sudbury too, um, where we're very proud of our landscapes. You know, the town puts a lot of energy into trying to protect um, our conservation areas and things like that. Um, we also tell the story about how one of our farming families would not sell water rights to for to build a, a large plant there, you know, car manufacturing endeavor. Um, so some of his plans for here in Sudbury were foiled by that lack of, you know, the water rights sale. So um, if not for Cavicchio's, uh, we might look entirely different in that area of our town. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is, I mean, I'm curious, I'm curious. Can I ask a question? Um, what is Ford's sort of image or public image, um, in Sudbury? Like, how do people think about him? 
and his relationship with the wayside. Okay, I want to see these answers in the chat. So type away. <laughs> um, but just to start off, I think there, I think a lot of people don't realize his impact on the Wayside Inn when they come to our property, that may or may not be the first thing that they're aware of. They're looking at this colonial setting and then they find out who built it or who recreated it or who protected it. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people are wide-eyed after we say, oh, well, Henry Ford was here. Um, mm -hmm. that, is, that is one reaction that we get. And I don't know, Lauren, if you want to agree, disagree. <laughs> Yeah, she agrees as well, because we've all encountered it oh, wow. when we're giving, uh, when we're walking around the property and bump into people and they're admiring a building and then we tell them why, you know, why it is this here. So um, does anybody else have other questions to add before we, before we, you know, adjourn, close? I had put one in there, Sally, about restrictions on, um, does does the association with Henry Ford have restrictions for what the inn can do as far as remodeling, you know, maintenance, any of those things? That, that would be, so the Wayside Inn Historic Site is within one of Sudbury's five historic districts. So the exteriors of the buildings are typically, um, you know, if we want to make modifications, we do have to go before the boards and that goes for repairs. Um, anything that would alter the look would have to go before the Historic District Commission. So that is one thing, but anything, you know, on the inside is outside of their purview. So that decisions are really made by staff and the Board of Trustees. We have an all volunteer Board of Trustees um, so we can really do what we want and we try to always make decisions that are in the best interest of our historical story. Um, but we also are mindful that we have, you know, modern clientele coming in. And so we have to run the operation so that it is, you know, on par with what people expect when they come to stay or to dine. And then, um, you know, that's really that's really how we adapt our site at this point. So I hope that answered your question, so but it's not related to Ford per se. There, is there any connection still between the Henry Ford Foundation and the Inn? Not at this point in terms of managing the um, governance. Okay. I hope that helps. Anyone else have anything? Okay, well, I just, we, we cannot thank you enough, Jesse, for preparing that to kick off our whole year's worth of, of information that we'll be putting out there. Um, I want to thank everyone who is coming and just to let you know that on March 7th, we will be having a talk from Michael McCluskey, who's here on the Zoom, um, about the history of the Wayside and Boys School. And that will be a combination in person and Zoom. So take a look at wayside.org to, um, to register for that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we will be having an exhibit on the second floor in our museum gallery, uh, which relates to the 100 years of preservation and the, the evolution of our buildings. So um, it's exciting to be able to offer something new up there. Um, and then in terms of if you missed anything or you want to review, uh, this program has been recorded and will be on our YouTube channel um, shortly after we have a chance to review and edit and make it perfect. So um, <laughs> once again, thank you very much, Dr. Swigger. We really appreciate it that you are willing to do this for us. And we appreciate all of you for attending as well. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the great questions. I really appreciate it.